I had recorded my manager's sales pitch. I listened to it on repeat for a good 30 minutes, just writing down line by line what he had said. And then I sat there for another 30 minutes and memorized it. And I got up and made two sales that day. And long story short, I became the the top rookie salesman in the company that summer. And it kind of launched me into a sales career in the door-to-door industry where I eventually started two solar companies and uh, really you know, paved the way for me to get into real estate. Welcome to The Real Freedom Show, where we inspire you to pursue your passion to gain time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. I'm your host, Mike Swenson. Let's get some real freedom together. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Real Freedom, where we're talking about building time and financial freedom through different opportunities in real estate. I'm your host, Mike Swenson. And uh, with today's story, we've got a really cool story of somebody who had a lot of success in sales, previously to that athletic success as well in, in basketball, but sales background, kicked it over into real estate and now does investing in some very large properties. So we've got Anders Jacobson here. He is the founder of Brighton Capital, and he'll talk a little bit more about the types of deals that he's doing. Um, But now we're looking at what, 17 assets, 2,500 units across five states. You're gonna be launching short-term rental fund as well. So just a lot of great stuff that you're doing. We're so excited to have you on the show, Anders. Yeah, excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Mike. Share a little bit about your background before real estate and getting into real estate and, and We'll go from there. Absolutely. So I'll take it back to 2011. I was, it was summertime, beginning of summer in May. I uh, just finished up my first year of, of college and I was sitting on the sidewalk in Detroit, Michigan. And honestly, it was one of the lowest points of my life. And people were driving by wondering what the heck's this kid doing here. And uh, I was, I had just gone out there to sell home security systems door to door. And I had done that because about a month prior, I was told that I was going to have to pay for the rest of my schooling myself. And I had just ever drafted my bank account. So I didn't just have no money. I had, I was in the negative. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was at this low point, had this opportunity to go sell home security systems door to door. Uh, completely out of my comfort zone, no experience doing anything like that. But they told me I could make enough money to pay for my school the next year. And my basketball team had just won the national championship and I was named the MVP. And so the last thing I wanted to do was have to change schools. Uh, I was picturing, you know, repeat champions, all these records that we're going to break. And then it comes crashing down saying, oh, you may not even be able to go back to school and you have absolutely no money. So I go out to Detroit, Michigan, and I got a total of two hours of sales training, uh, basically just shadowing my sales manager as he knocks on doors. And this was on a Saturday. And after lunch, he says, all right, Anders, you're on your own drops me out uh, of his his minivan. That's where he'd drop us all off in our neighborhood and say, I'll pick you back up at 9 p.m. And so he drops me off and I knocked on my first door and it was just a complete disaster. I just stumbled over my words, looked like a fool. Uh, the person obviously shut the door on me. <laughs> and uh, I walked away just tail between my legs, deflated. And I sat down on the corner in this this neighborhood on the sidewalk. And as I'm sitting there, it was kind of this pivotal moment for me where it was like, look, I I can quit and go home and try to get another job or get three jobs and try to figure out a way to get back to, to school or I can, you know, go take out loans, whatever it may be, or I can do whatever I can to fight my way out of this, this corner and position I'm in to, to make it work. And so uh, I sat there, I had recorded my manager's sales pitch. I listened to it on repeat for a good 30 minutes, just writing down line by line what he had said. And then I sat there for another 30 minutes and memorized it. And I got up and made two sales that day. 
And long story short, I became the the top rookie salesman in the company that summer. And it kind of launched me into a sales career in the door to door industry where I eventually started two solar companies and uh, really, you know, paved the way for me to get into real estate. So that's kind of my background and, and, uh, what really launched me to where I am today. I was a business major in college and we we took this management course and the professor at the time said, you know, the best thing you can do is go into sales because you learn so much about business. You learn so much about yourself, handling rejection, people skills. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do sales. And so I found every way to not do sales for the first 15, 20 years of my career. And then now I feel like I've I've learned so much as a real estate agent, as an investor, talking with investors. It's sales, but it doesn't feel like sales. You know, you're just having good conversations with people. But I think I could have probably fast forwarded things by getting into sales much sooner like you did. Yeah, I, I think the best salesmen don't come off as salesmen. And I feel like that's really been kind of my my strength is I'm not a sales guy. I don't I never considered myself a sales guy. Um, and I truly cared about, you know, the, the people and the, the problem we're trying to solve. And lucky enough, I was able to, you know, sell a product, uh, long-term in the solar industry that I truly believed in and, and now real estate, uh, you know, believe in it the most. So yeah, been, been lucky enough there, but yeah, I definitely believe sales skills correlate and can benefit, uh, in so many other ways. So talk about kind of that journey into real estate, what caught your eye, what got you excited about it? And then kind of that point where you're, you're diving in. So I got into sales, was doing really well and was one of the, you know, I transitioned into solar in 2015 and was making, you know, more money than I ever thought I would. And at that point, I'm trying to figure out what to do with it, you know, and everyone smarter and everyone I've talked to uh, growing up is talking about investing. And when I heard the word investing, I always just, you know, automatically thought stock market. That's, that's what it means to invest. Mm -hmm. And so I was newly married. We took a large chunk of our money uh, it was about a fourth of our our savings and had put it in the in one stock in the stock market it was really smart on my end so uh, <laughs> uh one stock it was it was the largest renewable energy company in the world at the time they had just positioned to buy one of the largest residential solar companies in the United States so i mean everything was trending upwards at least that's what they said and every Every brokerage, anything said it was a good time to buy. So I we bought a lot of it. And then come to find out the company was run by a CEO who was, you know, doctoring books and they were doing some shady things and they they went bankrupt and we mm -hmm. lost all our money. And so it was super embarrassing for me. I, I remember feeling sick to my stomach and just having the thought like I will never let this happen again. And so from that moment on, I really was on a journey and motivated to find a better vehicle for investing. And I started devouring books, podcasts, going to in-person events, really just trying to figure out what are the ultra successful people in the world doing? Um, what are they investing in? And the one common common denominator that I found was commercial real estate, multifamily real estate. Everyone who was successful and wealthy was investing in that through that vehicle. And so uh, that's really how I learned about it and started to to dive in uh, the next year by investing in a, a large uh, property passively. Um, I had just launched my first solar company super busy, didn't have the time to go out and be finding properties on my own. And so I invested passively with an operator and it was great. I loved it. I started getting passive income and uh, tax benefits. And I, I saw the real potential with it. And then I had a, a buddy from a mastermind group that introduced me to, you know, doing some flips. And so I, I tried out a different, a few different uh, avenues and did flips, 
uh, did some long-term rentals. We bought a couple short-term rentals and along the way, still investing passively. And at the end of the day, I just, I kept coming back to large multifamily. It was, it was what I loved and what I saw had the most, um, you know, benefit, especially just with the being passive, um, for me and with how busy I was. And so, uh, kind of went all in on that in 2020 and have, haven't looked back since. So then now you're full-time investing. At what point did you get rid of the day stuff or did you sell your company or how, how did that work? Yeah. So sold my company at the beginning of last year. And that's when I started, uh, I had, I had started my real estate company, Brighton Capital, where we, I help investors who are like me get into large multifamily deals uh, passively. And so I was doing that already when I sold my solar company. Uh, it was time to go all in on on Brighton Capital and really focus on that. And so uh, last year was the first year where really started to reach out to investors and really build a large investor pool and and start vetting. Oh, I've been vetting operators for years, but really mm -hmm. start deciding which ones I wanted to work with long term. Now, talk about how this works where you have your own company, you can kind of choose where to place funds. So like you're building relationships with investors and then you're finding essentially great investment opportunities for them, but you're kind of an, an independent party in the middle of that, which I think sometimes people don't always understand how that works in the, the multifamily and syndication side. So kind of talk about, you know, you've got Brighton Capital, but yet you can be placing things in with other larger vehicles, which is what makes this part really cool. It's flexible, it's scalable. You can, you know, choose different people, different types of asset classes. So kind of talk about that process of finding the operators and matching them up with your investors and in, in the deals they want to invest in. That's a great, great point. I, I love it. Uh, to your point, not being exclusive with one operator has been huge for me um, and our investors, because we're, we're, if we were exclusive with one operator, we're you know limited to the deals they find. And uh, I'm very big believer in not telling anybody to do anything that you haven't done yourself or aren't willing to do yourself. And so for me, I invested passively and I vetted these operators for years. And now I can speak to my investors and say, this is what I've done. I've looked everywhere these different asset classes and I've found the best of the best. I've actually put my money where my mouth is. Mm -hmm. I invested first. I put my capital at risk and saw how they performed, how they communicated and they've exceeded expectations this operator has. So now I'm going to partner with them and allow other investors to, you know, come alongside me for the ride and invest in their deals. So I love it. And being able to expand into different asset classes and do the same vetting process there has been really fun as well. Talk about some of the deals you've done or some of the the markets that you've explored and what's kind of been that thing, that tipping point where you said, okay, this is the deal that I'm ready to do with this operator in this market. So I have specific uh, a specific buy box that, you know, if the deal doesn't meet this criteria for my investors, then you know, just on to the next one. And so some operators consistently find deals that fit into that buy box where others, maybe it's one or two do per year. Um, and, and I'm willing to look at those, but in general, we're heavily focused on the Southeast. I'm mm -hmm. from North Carolina, live in Raleigh. I lived in Charleston, South Carolina for six years and know the Southeast very well. It's where I operated my solar company. Um, Outside of the Southeast, really like Texas, like Arizona, um, you know, Sun Belt, it, we really target those markets. But uh, with an operator, we're we're vetting them out specifically, uh, maybe even more than the deal, because the the operator, from what I've seen, is is a bigger impact than maybe even the asset itself. So you could have the greatest asset in the world, but uh, a bad operator doesn't know what they're doing and it, it could fall flat, um, where the opposite goes. If you have a, 
you know, a, a decent asset, but a great operator, they can turn that into a slam dunk. Talk about the strategy on some of these properties. So for people that maybe haven't heard of the large multifamily, what that looks like, it's not like I'm just flipping a house. Sometimes I actually explain it like a, a long flip, right? It's just, it <laughs> takes time to flip all the units in a property, but talk right. about that strategy, maybe in light of one of the last deal or two that you've done as an example. Yeah. So we just closed on a property basically Charleston, South Carolina. It's it's one of the suburbs, Mount Pleasant. And I lived there. We found an amazing asset. It's 108 units. And we bought this property is 100% occupied, uh, which is rare. Uh, the reason why it was 100%, 100% occupied is because it was owned by a family and they didn't know where the market rent was. They were charging twelve hundred a month for rent, and the market rent was twenty two hundred. So they're a thousand dollars under market rent. So no surprise, people weren't moving out. People were uh, just piling on top of <laughs> like clawing at people to get in those units for a thousand dollars off. Exactly. Yeah. And then it was managed by the family's daughter completely, and she was just super lenient on people paying late. So it was uh yeah, there was no reason for anybody to move out of this property. So 100% occupied when we purchased it. Obviously, we are going to give them notice, say, hey, you guys are paying 1000 under the market. Rents are going to bump up. When we announced that, it wasn't a $1,000 all at once. We, we bumped it up about $400 right away uh, or gave notice that we're going to do that. Nobody wanted to move out still. So... Hmm. That was a uh, that was a good uh, a good thing, and then we also had a, a large amount of people on month to month. And most properties, you're going to have a handful of month to month tenants. And if when you're doing a value add project, you you need to strategically turn these units or renovate these units because if you let everybody know, uh, if you move you buy a property and you let everybody know that they need to. Uh, vacate the property, then there's no income. So you have to strategically do it where uh, you take, hey, we're we're taking 10, uh, 10 apartments this month and we're going to renovate those. And while we're renovating those, we're giving notice to the next 10 that uh, mm -hmm. we're not going to renew their lease or they need to move out in 60 days. And so you're constantly renovating units while giving notice to tenants that they need to move out because we need to renovate theirs. The first wave of tenants is usually the most difficult because especially if it's 100% occupied, you don't have anywhere to move them. So mm -hmm. they essentially just need to move and find a new location. But once you get through that first wave, you give notice to the next group of tenants, but now you have brand new apartments that you just renovated and you can give them the option of moving into a brand new, nice uh, unit, which is always you know nice to offer them. Yeah. And then you're really keeping the cream of the crop, the folks that are willing to pay the most and want to stay there the most. And then you slowly find the ones that now want to move into those units. So it, it does take time. And I think that's what the tricky part that sometimes people don't always realize is number one, it's real people. But number two, you're raising maybe the quality of tenant, the type of tenant, or uh, maybe more honing in on your ideal future tenant by slowly going through those changes. Yeah. And I think I have investors that ask all the time or, you know, sometimes are concerned with raising rents that much on a tenant. And the way I, I had concerns too, when I first started investing, I was like, well, are we really going to be able to raise that, the, the rent two or $300 in that short of a span? And I can tell you from being on the other side, on the management side now, it's been eye-opening to see some of these units haven't been renovated in 20 plus years. And the quality of the living environment is just really low. Uh, mm -hmm. We had units where people were paying $650 in one of our properties, $650 a month, which is super cheap, but their cabinets had holes in them. Their, their uh, you know, walls were falling apart. There was so many issues in the unit. And then we completely renovated it, made it look brand new. Rents went up about $500 at this property because we mm -hmm. made it look brand new. And we expected a lot of these tenants to move out and not a single one did. They were so 
willing to pay that extra money to live in a clean, safe, new environment uh, and, and unit that they were willing to pay that extra amount. Real estate agents, are you tired of letting the busyness of your real estate business get in the way of your real estate investing goals and your financial future? I'm excited to announce that we've created the Real Freedom Investor Agent Tribe to help you. We've got a ton of content, educational tools to help accelerate your learning curve and get you on the right path to hit your investing goals. We also have a mastermind tribe of people just like you, agents that wanna grow their own portfolio and encourage you and cheer you on along the way, as well as some private one-on-one -on -one coaching. So go to realfreedom.com, click on the store, you'll see the options there. We're so excited to be able to help you. I've priced it super low so price can't get in the way, but did wanna have some skin in the game for you to help with that accountability. So go check it out, realfreedom.com, click on the store. We're excited to connect with you and excited for you to connect with your tribe of real estate agents, investing, trying to build their financial freedom. Now for your investors that you work with that aren't gonna necessarily have eyes on the property or go visit the property, what are maybe some of the concerns that they have or barriers that they put in place where they're like, you know what, Anders, I'm, I'm not sure I wanna invest in this property or into this particular market. What are some of those top issues? I'd say one is they don't, they've never been to the market. So they don't, they don't know. Uh, the growth that's happening there. Um, and the others, a lot of times they're just new. So they, mm -hmm. they're they thinking small. They're thinking, uh, you know, to your point, kind of just like a regular flip. They don't realize uh, that there's so much more involved in these large properties. You have a whole uh, operations team that's, we're doing this consistently where, as soon as we buy the property, we have a whole plan in place where it's systematized, where X amount's happening. So I think a lot of it's just unknown. Mm -hmm. There, You can't just Google uh, and, and find answers or, or get tons of information on these uh, investments. And so I think there, a lot of it's just lack of knowledge and the unknown is what they're trying, really trying to overcome or what I'm trying to help them overcome when I'm chatting mm -hmm. with them. Um, but I love that part because people can act like this vehicle is super complicated and real estate syndication sounds fancy and, uh, but it's, it is really simple model. I mean, we're really mm -hmm. just joining forces to, to buy these large properties because we couldn't do it on our own. We don't have the capital to take down a $30 million deal on our own. So we mm -hmm. bring on partners, um, who they don't have the time to take down or manage this property. And so we give our time and our energy to manage it. They give their capital to invest and we give them great returns in, uh, you know, as, as in return for their investment. Now talk a little bit about the economies of scale here. Cause somebody might say, Hey, I can just go take that money, buy a house and flip it myself or buy my own duplex and do it myself. Why would I want to invest in a, a hundred plus unit apartment? So Mike, the whole reason I, we don't have time to get into this uh, property uh, on this podcast, but uh, I kind of went over it quickly, but I did a couple flips, some long-term rentals. And one of them in particular was kind of what broke me uh, and said, I'll never do these small properties again. It was a four unit deal. And it, obviously, you know, four, four tenants, on paper, if everyone pays rent, everything goes smoothly. You know, I'm making fifteen hundred plus a month on this property, which sounds great. That would have been an awesome mm -hmm. return. Uh, long story short, ran into every issue in the book of this property. COVID hit. Tenants weren't paying rent. Had to do a handful of evictions. Finally, get it filled. One of the tenants' uh, children catches a unit on fire. Everyone has to move out. Uh, the fire department comes, busts all my windows that were brand new, cuts a hole in my roof, just mm -hmm. every issue imaginable. Um, and but the biggest thing that I found was that, you know, if two tenants don't pay rent of this property, I'm I'm in the negative. Mm -hmm. uh, where if I have a hundred and seventy unit property, two tenants don't pay rent. That's actually already factored into our underwriting. We expect mm -hmm. it to be about 94% occupied. So mm -hmm. that 6% is already factored in. Uh, so we're, we have a buffer there 
And so the economies of scale is just, even if we have 10 people at the property that don't pay rent that month, it's actually okay. We're still mm -hmm. cash flow and we're still making good money where even if I didn't run to issues on that four unit and I just had a couple HVACs go out that year, then there goes all my profit for the year. You know, there's just mm -hmm. that economies of scale is huge. Now talk a little bit about what you're doing here coming up with short-term rentals. Yeah. So we, me and my wife purchased a handful of short, short-term rentals uh, and we still, still have those. And we love that, uh, that vehicle and had the opportunity to, you know, partner with some operators who have really taken it to a whole nother level. So they've taken the, the multifamily large apartment syndication model and done that with short-term rentals. So uh, they created a fund where they buy single family properties and convert them into these unbelievable short-term rental stays, put them on Airbnb, VRBO, all the sites. Uh, they have, you know, colorful basketball courts, pickleball courts, uh, uh, go-kart tracks in the backyard, these amazing pools. They have murals on the wall. They're just these unbelievable stays for, uh, for families, businesses, you know, family reunions, whatever it may be. Um, and they do it in markets that are heavily, heavy vacation markets. So they're not going to run into any issues legally or laws changing in these markets uh regarding you know short-term rentals so uh partnering with this group bringing on investors and have really exciting uh opportunity where long term could sell to uh could package all these properties together which we hope to get about a hundred properties in one portfolio and you know package it and sell it to private equity um, or we could sell them individually. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Great. And yeah, you're doing a great service where, you know, instead of going back to your story, like kind of picking one stock and hope it succeeds, you're giving people a few different options of things to invest in. You're personally going and vetting all these people out. So a busy salesperson doesn't have to do that work. They just have to put their trust in you and know that you know what you're doing vetting them out. But yeah, it's just such a great tool and, and syndication is, is just a great opportunity for people to be able to put in some money and just have a much bigger impact in economies of scale. So very exciting what you're doing. For people that wanna reach out to you and learn more about it, how can they do so? Yeah, go to my website. It's www.brightoncapital.io. Just click to join the club plug in your info and then you'll get an email to set up a call directly with me and uh, love to chat with you and hear what you're interested in and see if we can uh, you know potentially partner together awesome well thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your story and hopefully inspiring others and helping people uh, build wealth through real estate so thanks so much yeah thank you mike appreciate it